Hi, I'm George Saunders. Uh, I'm the author of a novel called Lincoln and the Bardo, uh, which just came out in the UK. Uh, it's a story about um, Abe Lincoln uh, going into the crypt where his son had just been buried. He's so grief-stricken. Uh, and he actually, uh, according to newspapers, held the body and interacted with his son. So out of that historical seat, I kind of made this um, uh, kind of a fantasia, uh, one night in the graveyard, uh, narrated by a chorus of ghosts. So, so the book is kind of told uh, in, in a series of hundreds of monologues, and some of them are, are ghosts speaking, uh, some of them are actual transcriptions from his, history books. Uh, and the form, it kind of evolved actually. I, I had first thought, well, I'll just, maybe I'll write it in sort of a standard third person. It was actually a little dull. And then I thought maybe I could narrate it from the point of view of Lincoln, and that was sort of fraught with peril because suddenly you're saying, you know, four score and seven years ago I did enter Yon graveyard. Uh, so it kind of evolved over a, about a year of, of work, and uh, it, it came to seem to me really kind of truthful in the sense that when uh, when any number of people are gathered together, if you really wanted the God's eye view of it, it's kind of 15 or 20 inner monologues sounding at once, and we interact in the, in the physical realm, but basically our minds are always going, uh, and that seemed to me like the, the closest approximation to what reality is. So it, it was sort of thrilling to sort of uh, stumble on this new form and then sort of learn what it could do at speed. It was almost like getting into a, some kind of weird new vehicle and trying to figure out what its capabilities were. For many years, I, I just considered myself purely a short story writer and I was actually kind of proud of it and kind of looked down on those sloppy, you know, verbose novelists. Um, and I really, I kind of didn't want to write this as a novel. I just, I, I had a kind of a almost an internalized practice every day of saying to the book, please don't bloat, because we, you know, we don't need another novel actually in the world. So it kind of got to be the length it did just because it in insisted. Uh, the only thing that I noticed in the process was that, you know, if you think of writing a story as, you know, you're working and in the process you throw some bowling pins in the air, and then, you know, in a short story, the, you sort of know there's three up there, they come down, and that's the end. This one was just like that, except somehow when the pins went up, they multiplied in the air. I mean, not through any intention of mine. And then when they came down, it almost was like they, they were coming down of their own volition in a certain order. And all I had to do was kind of mind the store a little bit. You know, I had to kind of um, do the technical work of, of uh, organizing sections and stuff. But there was a really kind of lovely... Um, maybe a month and a half where I was writing the last 40 pages and it was almost like I just had to show up and a bowling pin would come down, oh thank you, you know. Uh, it, it wasn't automatic but it felt as if something bigger than me had been put in motion and then I just had to sort of show up and, and service it a little bit. So that was a new, a new feeling. There was also something, this book was, um, because of the subject matter, uh, I had to leave certain of my habitual gifts at the door. So if you're writing a book about um, you know, the, a father and a son and grief and so on. Uh, there are certain satirical moves that I couldn't use that a contemporary voice was out of the question. So that was sort of a kind of a form of handcuffs a little bit. And I, I think for an artist, that kind of constraint can be very useful. So in this case, I had to kind of um, sort of allow myself to work with more sincere material and more earnestly. Uh, and it felt like some thin ice, it was, it was new. And I think that also contributed because suddenly I was getting myself into emotional turf that I hadn't done in fiction before, which, you know, at this stage of a career is really great. If you, you know, because you get to a certain crossroads where you might know a little too well what you do. And if you just keep doing that, you get in an artistic death spiral. So uh, the alternative is to kind of force yourself into discomfort, actually. So that, that was, I think, why the the book ended up being a little bit bigger than I thought because I really went out into some stuff I, I wasn't so sure about. Yeah. I had two rules. One was uh, don't dishonor Willie. So I had a picture of him over my desk to remember it was a real person and not a, a literary projection. The second one was that anything I did that was weird or experimental or innovative had to be in the service of the emotional power of the book. So uh, at one point I, had a, I, I was getting some pretty good energy going with a lot of the ghosts and I just felt like it was, um, you know, with, with ghosts, when you're writing ghosts, you have such a high degree of freedom that I think the reader can kind of go, eh, you're having too much fun. They're like dream sequences. There's no rules, really. So, um, and also, for me, a lot of the reason the story stayed with me all those years was I, I'd become acquainted with some of the backstory about Willie's, who he was, and 
a big party the Lincolns threw right before his death and all that. So at some point I thought, I need some kind of historical spine here just to buttress the whimsicality of the ghost, just to counterweight it. So I thought, well, I, I guess I'll just, you know, write a kind of Gore Vidalish uh, third person summary of all those things. And I just got this feeling, which is, for me, anti-art, which is like a buzzkill, like, oh, God, okay, I'll do that. Oh. Um, so whenever I get that feeling, you know, I don't want to go there and I try to think of an alternative. So in this case, I just sort of ask myself, well, where, you know, where do you know, how do you know all this historical fact? I'm like, well, I read it in a history book. And the light went on. I thought, could I just sort of, like as in hip hop, you know, just sample those things directly? And I thought, well, it's my book. Yeah, I guess I could, you know. So I started doing it. I just uh, typed up a bunch of the um, historical references that I knew, pages and pages, started cutting them up with scissors and spending days arranging them. And uh, the convincer was that, you know, at some point you say, this ver version 27 is a lot better than version 1. Well, I'm doing some kind of work here. And what I had done, I thought, would, would actually uh, heighten the emotional effect. So th therefore, I'd give myself permission to, you know, to sample historical text. So at some point, you're, you know, I'm reading a chapter. And uh, I guess as always happens when you're rereading your work, you know, uh, images come in your head. Now, oh, if I had this, that would be better. If I had a, a linking image, that would be better. Uh, so in one case, I just made one up. I made up a, a, like a, an imitation of a historical source. And uh, a door flew open. I'm like, wow, this could be an amazing thing. If I could. And so then uh, I just started making them up, basically. And the in the first pass, they were always kind of crazier and more flamboyant and better written than the originals. So they stuck out. So then in the second pass, it was always to take whatever I'd done and tone it down so, it, so ideally the reader wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, and then once you, once you introduce something like that, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. You, you have to then continue that through the rest of the book because you've introduced it, and you have to make sure that that move gets more and more intense as it goes along. So I think towards the end of the book, I was taking more liberties with that. But, but always the idea was, you know, a novel is a, uh, or a story is, is a thrill-producing machine. That's what it's for. It's, it's to put the reader in that state. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, an irreducible, uh, above the verbal state where you can't really explain this magic thing is happening to you, but it's definitely happening. That's the goal. So everything else is subservient to that. So if, if you make stuff up to produce that, great. If you uh, inject real stuff, it's fine. So it was kind of a clarifying thing to say, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing I want to happen is for the reader to kind of go, oh, you know, uh, to make that happen by any means necessary is kind of what I think what a novelist's job is. You, you're honoring the, the reader by saying, you know, uh, I know you're busy, I know you're smart, I know you've lived, let me not waste your time by just merely being performative, but I want to I wanna engage you, and, and I want to somehow uh, raise the questions that are actually on your mind today, Thursday, as you ride the bus on the way to work, uh, and if we can get in that kind of conversation, that's kind of beautiful for, for, for both of us.